welcome to you, uh, whether it's the middle of the night for some or early in the morning for others or middle of the day. Uh, this is a delight to have you with us and to have our brother Tim Timothy with us as well. Um, we are we're here to wish you Easter season greetings uh, to one and all. And as we begin our session, as we are in this Easter season, is also the synodal season. And so we count on the Spirit among us and ask to be able to listen deeply to what the Spirit longs to share and is sharing with us. My name is Sister Maria Simperman. I'm a religious of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, and I serve here at UISG as the Synodality Coordinator. So it's a delight to welcome you with us and to have our brother Timothy as well. Um, there are many things to be said, but you know many of you, Timothy. And so just two brief pieces that bring us to this moment. One is that in the Synod Assembly of 2023, Timothy was one of two retreat directors uh, and really a, a spiritual guide for the entire synod. Uh, he was co-directing the retreat with Sister Maria Ignazia Angelini, a Benedictine sister. Timothy is also a, a well-known author, and one of his most recent works that have been published are, is a book called Listening Together, Meditations on Synodality. And included in it are the presentations he offered during the Synod. Uh, but there's one that it hasn't been offered yet on, on public levels, at least for most of us. And it's the last chapter of the book, and it's on what synodality looks like in action in the Dominican order. So it's a sense of how does that, what does that look like in religious life? I must share that as now we've received most, I think all of the uh, synod responses from the general superiors, your congregations, uh, and your responses to the questions that the wide church is asking of religious life. I, I think as you read Timothy's, I think you will also have noticed in these months how much you have also to offer in terms of synodality, what religious offer. And there are many things that we've been working on over decades. And so there's this is a, a beautifully and profoundly important moment for the connection of the wide church and the contributions that religious life seeks to offer. So we'll speak to this in, in a little bit, um, but it links communal discernment, how we do participation, authority, leadership, governance. Those are all things that I, the wide church, the synod office was asking us to share and you shared and generously. So more on that soon. Our time today uh, is because we're so aware of how rich the Emmaus journey is for us uh, as people of faith. And also the synodal time is a journey, a pilgrimage for us, a walking together. Today, Timothy and I will have an Emmaus conversation, uh, sharing from both sources, both the Emmaus story and synod stories, some of our reflections, as well as what we sense the call is to be lived now. So we will speak for uh, a bit, and then we will also invite some of your questions, comments, uh, and uh, it, that will be open in the chat. So, Timothy, I'm so grateful that you are our brother here and able to share with us some of your reflections in these months of both the Emmaus journey and the Synod journey. So thank you, Timothy. You're muted. There we are. I tried to unmute earlier and it said that uh, I couldn't unmute myself, but it's very difficult to mute a Dominican. Uh, I'm delighted to be with you, all of you, uh, and especially with you, Maria. Uh, we did part of that synod journey together and we're keeping in contact. And it 
is a very fascinating time. And I think the Umer story is, is beautifully appropriate. Because what it does is it shows two people, and according to one tradition, Cleophas and Maria, running away from Jerusalem. And I think many people at this moment in the life of the church flee. They're disappointed. They don't think that we've made the progress we ought to have done. They look at the church and they don't want to have anything more to do with it. And even, I think, you see people disappointed with the synod. They say they met all those four weeks in Rome, endless discussions on what was achieved. Somebody stopped me in the street only yesterday and said, well, what was really achieved? And so quite a lot of people have this feeling, which I think the disciples on the way to Emmaus had, of disappointment. And how does Jesus react? He doesn't stop them. He doesn't block their path. He says to them, what are you talking about? And I think that this is the first step, really, for us in these, these coming months. When we meet each other, we have to ask, like Jesus, what are you talking about? What's in your heart? What's going on? What's disappointing you? What are you hoping for? And if we do that, if we share, if we walk with people wherever they're going, even as Jesus did when they're going in the wrong direction, then I think we will open our hearts and our minds and we will begin together to discover what's happening. A lot of people said, well, you know, you had another request to consider the question of women deacons. Uh, LGBT was not even mentioned by name. This is a retreat. We're not going forward. But I think what is happening is a deep, organic change in the nature of the church. Or you might say a recovery, a contact with its original founding nature, the community of God's friends. So in a church which is very often split, divided, filled with conflict, and sometimes anger, then we have to turn to each other and, like Jesus say, what are you talking about? And I think friendship that we experienced at the, at the Synod requires of each of us that we have a little transformation of our identity. It's a sort of death. Any real friendship opens you up in ways that you could never expect, transforms you, expands your heart and your mind. Every year I'm blessed with having young Dominicans who join the order in the English province, and I open myself to friendship with them, which means I listen, I discover what is their journey, what they seek, what brings them joy, what brings them pain, and that is transformative. And I think that was very much the first part of this synod. I think we also began to see something else. I think we became very aware in the synod, or most of us did, of how Western we are, the mindset of the church. So we had brothers from Africa, Asia, Latin America, and I think we're really only at the beginning of understanding, if you want, how to be a truly global church, how to be a church which is hospitable to many ways of thinking, many languages. Um, I'm just back from Australia. 
uh, which is why I'm still a bit jet lagged. And there I found intense debate in the Australian church about how we open ourselves to indigenous ways of thinking, indigenous ways of understanding the land, indigenous ways of greeting each other and of growing in a friendship. So I think that's another path that we're really on now. And finally, because uh, I'm eager to hear what you want to say, Maria. Finally, I think all sorts of questions of truth are cropping up. Is it true? And so I think this is a new moment in the synodal journey where we're going to need theologians to begin to contribute to the conversation, to enter into our conversation as we search to make more profound, if you want, the conversations that we have with each other, with the tradition, with the founders of our orders, and with the young today, our future. So that's a little bit, I think, of what we're doing as we walk together. Maria and Cleophas, or in this case, Maria and Timothy. Thank you, Timothy. And I too think that what happened when we were together, all of us, was that the spirit was in motion. You spoke about, and I, I want to thank you too, um, at, during the retreat, uh, you brought in scripture that invited us to friendship. And I've said to people, you know, I don't think many people came to the Synod thinking they were going there to make friends. We came to do the work of the Synod. But you invited us to open ourselves, to see the other, to engage the other, and literally to friendship. And I think that made a, an immense difference. And I think, too, I look at the disciples as they were walking. And, you know, I happen to be walking with uh, Timothy and Cleophas. I think it was a Cleophas uh, <laughs> in there. And, and what I found was they actually allowed their wounds to show to a, a, a seeming stranger. And so to me, it spoke of, we are at this moment in the church. We're, we're not even trying to hide the wounds. They're showing up. And I found very much at the Synod, there was no one there saying, ah, oh, the, the crisis of abuse isn't what you think it is or this. There was no defensiveness on, on some of the wounds. I think there's still a learning curve on where the wounds are. So where the wounds of women, where the wounds of those who've often been silenced, uh, those who don't even get welcomed when they are on a boat risking their very lives there. And so what I found very powerful with the Emmaus story is that the risen Christ responded to their whole being, a, a risen Christ that heard them and heard their hearts so that they could say, do you have no idea? Do you have any idea what we've lived in these days and, and invited them to listen? I found at the Synod, it was, if we did anything, we listened and listened and listened to all kinds of voices uh, of people that we don't often hear. And I found our brother bishops as eager as anyone else, because in previous synods, they perhaps spoke to just a few people. Now you were at a table mm -hmm. and you had 11 others and you really wanted to hear their perspectives. You wanted to hear what is it to be in a country where your bishop and the and your religion is really suspect from the beginning? Or what is it to be trying to hold a polarized society um, and, and to bring some unity? So I found um, it was powerful. And the scripture passage is amazing because it's linked by resurrection appearances. So, uh, and the Emmaus disciples say, we heard the women of our group. So they're already part of the group, but they, they couldn't hear it. Mm -hmm. And then they went, and then they also said, but then 
you know, the the others, the other men in the group went too, and they couldn't hear it. So it's we spoke a little a few days ago, and in the invitation, can we ask to hear what we don't always hear? Can we ask to open ourselves? And so the listening is a real invitation to all of us. Thinking is as well. So the risen Christ invited them to think. Remember your scripture. Remember what it said. And then he helped them understand it in new ways. And I think that's an invitation as well. At the synod tables, what I found sometimes was we have the three rounds of conversation in the spirit and people shared and we moved and, and we had a bit of a draft before lunch and then people came back with whole new questions that they had been pondering, that they had walked with, or perhaps took a siesta with. And we sometimes went a whole circle again in order to understand more deeply, even if we landed in the same space. So, you know, maybe just the last point I, I found myself aware of is how relational Jesus was with them, that the the disciples said to stay with us. Again, it was a perfect stranger, but something, something. And I think the conversation in the spirit does exactly that. It says, not just what you think, but what's moving in you, what's stirring in you. And it's a real invitation at this point in religious life also to bring all of those pieces. Um, because what we also need and what we're being offered is, is a sense of that remembrance. And maybe my last point, uh, when Jesus broke, when the risen Christ uh, blessed, broke bread, something clicked, that deep memory of, of all the different times when bread was broken and shared among them. And, and it's that deep memory. And I think that one of the pieces for me is that movements sometimes begin way ahead of what we can understand at a moment. I, it was powerful at one point when I was doing some research on religious life and, and collaboration. It was already in 1950 that Pope Pius XII gathered general superiors, leaders of women and men religious in Rome and said to them, if you find ways to work together to collaborate, you will be a transformative force in the world and in the church. Mm -hmm. And it, it was before Vatican II that on every continent, there were already conferences of religious. So something was moving well before so that, you know, when Vatican II happened, religious were reading the documents and today, it's not just religious, but we have such an incredible wide laity and, you know, seminaries have opportunities for more uh, education than they might have before. So there's something moving, but I think it, it needs us to, you know, as you said, we have a hard time. We, we think it's not all changed already. Um, that perhaps part of the letting go is how I think it needs to be changed. And maybe the spirit, which is far more creative than any of us here, will move things we can't even imagine. So those are some of my thoughts uh, in this. I don't know if you had more to bring to that, Timothy, but I'd love to hear more also about what you sensed in these months since the Synod. I, I, I'm... I think that friendship is so important and it's just not a nice feeling. Uh, friendship for us essentially is a sharing in the life of God. According to Aquinas, who you know, Maria, I have to mention all the time. Personally. According to Aquinas, the life of God is the divine friendship. That is salvation, is to enter into friendship. I think some religious were taught to be very fearful of friendship. It's dangerous. You don't know what it'll do to you. But actually, it's our salvation. Looking at my own life, I think I've been formed by all the friendships that I've had, the loves that I've had. And they really shaped me. And it's not over. 
I think the moment one stops being open to new friendships, you have a sort of death. So um, let us go on. Let us continue that adventure. I think the wounds, I was so glad you mentioned that too. The risen Christ appears and he shows them his wounds in John's gospel. He is forever wounded. And I don't think that we come alive. I don't think we really live unless we overcome our fear of getting hurt. You can't have joy without being hollowed out sometimes by sorrow. And so our wounds can be great blessings if we share them, if we share them with our friends. I remember a French Dominican, Jacques Laval, wrote a novel in which he talked about his own wounds. And he gave me a copy of the book when I was a young Dominican student. And he said, for you, Timothy, who know in your heart that the scars can become doors of light. The light can shine through as it shone through for those disciples locked up in a room, locked up because they didn't believe Mary Magdalene, that she'd met the Christ. I'm afraid not believing women has a long, long history in our church, going right back to the beginning. I think we're on the journey. I think what the disciples running away from Emmaus couldn't understand was that nothing seemed to have changed. Christ had risen from the dead, but the emperor was still on the throne. The Roman army was still occupying. Uh, they were still being oppressed. But there was a profound change going on in the soil, in their lives, and it wouldn't bear fruit until suddenly the world was changed. Over to you, Maria. Yeah, no, it's, it's powerful. Um, a few years ago, when there was a consultation with the women religious and the men religious uh, as part of the listening sessions. Uh, and it was questions about your experience of synodality, seeds and weeds of synodality. And also, um, what would you, what do you sense is God's dream for the church and also for religious life? I was really moved. There were a few places and it was both men and women who said at some point for the new to emerge, we will have to let go even of our hurts. Mm -hmm. um, and here I, I'm not speaking of, you know, the, the hurts I, of, of some of the abuses. It's not to say that there isn't a journey in there, but um, I, hurts within the church, hurts within uh, interactions that, that we ask for healing and we know healing is God's to do. Mm -hmm. uh, we can ask for it. But there's, there's, so, I am finding myself so caught by even anointing, uh, and and what that does. That that there's something that's being invited of us in the church right now because what we're hearing is really the echoes of of Lumen Gentium and uh, the church is the people of God, which of course begins with the church is is mystery as God um, and. And uh, when we speak about your good friend, uh, Thomas Aquinas, you know, he speaks about like God is pure act, pure energy, that mm -hmm. that sense that moves through all of us uh, and can do so much. And it's it's this reflecting about the anointing, which is what we receive at baptism and then with the spirit. Uh, and then also when we have the anointing of the sick, and, and of course there's the anointing uh, with ordination, presbyterate and diaconate, but I was just thinking those, those are all linked right now, and we're being invited to even help, I, you know, to ask, can you help me see differently? And, you know, I've taught at two schools of theology, I'm still at CTU, and 
And so you'll often hear, but the seminarians, the seminarians and, and are not on board. And I think we'll have to do something that Sister Natalie Baker actually said at one point, and it was just, there are always going to be places where you're not going to see the light. But one of our calls is going to be to name where we do see some light. And I found you know, already it was August before the synod began. It was there was a conference in Fiji, which is really the people there feel like they are on the ends of the earth uh, and as far away from Rome as anyone can be. And yet that was the most synodal conference I have ever participated in. 200 some people, 99 of them were seminarians. Half of them were religious and half were diocesan. And then they invited 40 some younger women religious. And then they invited 40 some lay leaders from the different islands. So this was the whole area. And then there were maybe 20 leaders uh, from religious orders. And it was really organized by the CMSPI, the Conference of Major Superiors of the Pacific Islands. And they were vulnerable with one another. They listened to one another. It was actually one of the most beautiful synodal experiences until I got to our synod. And so I think we need to name those spaces and also to create some of those spaces. When I left the synod proper, and you and I both, you've been offering many more presentations, but in the, in the conversations that all of us who had the privilege of being at the synod were asked to do is share the experience. And, and one thing for me is this can happen anywhere. This is not limited to the Synod. Anywhere we can have conversation in the spirit. It, it's very learnable. It's, it's very offerable. And it's also needed in our local churches. So what's been your experience and what are you sensing moving us? Well, I, I've spent a lot of time uh, giving talks about the Synod. I found middling interest in the States. I found a lot of interest in Australia and in Ireland. I have to confess, not much interest in Britain. Uh, and it, it's, it's odd that I, de I think people, if any good conversation means that you lose a bit of control. If you really open up a conversation with a friend, you don't know quite where it'll take you. And that's, I think, a bit frightening for a lot of people. How do we dare lose control of our lives? And we live in a society which is all about control. I think ever since the 16th century, the we've seen a mechanical understanding of the world. So everything must be regulated, measured, controlled. You don't want to start anything till you're going to know how it's going to finish. But the life of the church, as Pope Francis often insists, requires of us that we have the courage to let go a bit of control. That means not saying my agenda has to triumph, my will must be done. Let's see where the Holy Spirit takes us. And uh, that's why I think a lot of people back away from the Synod nervously um, and because if it doesn't go where you expect then that challenges your identity and you might get hurt you might get wounded i always love a saying of my brother herbert mccabe i might well have quoted it in in the synod he used to say he lived next door to me or i lived next door to him for 20 years and he said if you love you get hurt. You may even die. If you don't love, you're dead already. Uh, and I think that that's the, the adventure. It's the adventure of coming alive. 
Um, which is why Pope Francis said time and again, it's the Holy Spirit that is the protagonist of the Synod. Let's see where we are led. Because you don't know where it comes and you don't know where it goes. That's the excitement. And that's also the slightly terrifying thing. <laughs> You're absolutely right. And, uh, and it's going to change. This movement of the spirit is going to shift all of us, is, is asking something of all of us. Even the people who are saying, I really, really want this. And there's so much really a renewal needed in our church and also in religious life. Um, we will find those spaces, uh, both of uh, amazing movement and our own tensions. So I'm thinking of today's uh, first reading is Philip traveling and encountering someone who wants to know what is it I'm reading and something moves and the spirit moves. And when I think about it, if we were trying to control Christianity or the, the movement to the 11 plus the women, we, we wouldn't have 1.3 billion people as we're, we're saying right now. And, but instead the spirit's moving in all kinds of ways. And I think the invitation is to be open. There's a, a, a challenging document that came out right after the Senate. And I'm not sure if it was meant to challenge the theologians quite there, but um, it's the apostolic letter, Ad Theologiam Provenandum. And it's asking theologians to smell like the sheep, to mm -hmm. do our theology among the people, listening to them. There was a wonderful moral theologian, Norbert Regali, who talked years ago. I would read his, I would reread his essay during my studies. And it was the vocation of the moral theologian is, is to listen to the cries of the people and, and really know what the it is that the teachings of the church are, and to find a way to walk with the people in both, the people that are part of both in this. And, and I think this is a real call to theologians to say, what's the contextual lens of our the theology and how do we help one another? So as you said, how do we understand um, theology from different places, mm -hmm. from El Salvador, um, from the Congo, from New Zealand, from Chicago? And, and what will that invite us to? Because that's the call. And it was Cardinal Hollerich um, who did a, a, offered a beautiful intervention or introduction at one point when we hit, came to the questions that had a, you know, a lot of dynamism to them. And he said, now we're coming to areas that have a little more tension, mm -hmm. but we can walk this. We can manage these tensions mm -hmm. as long as we remember that we are brothers and sisters in Christ. And if we can do that, we can hold it. And I do believe that was one of the things that, that happened. That was really one of the little miracles of mm -hmm. holding and welcoming, actually, diverse perspectives and opinions. And in one of our conversations a week or so ago, I think we talked about how this moment in so many governments is a time uh, where democracy, even a sense of everyone's voice is welcome and brought forth, uh, is, is I, under, under duress, is being challenged, that people are, are being told to be quiet, or you have people coming up in leadership who do not see the dignity of each person. And, and this, you can go to almost every continent or cities and, and find examples. And, and here's one of the little miracles already that the church is actually being countercultural. Mm -hmm. The church right now, Pope Francis is saying, I want to hear everyone. Mm -hmm. We need your voices. How do we do participation of all the people of God, of all the baptized. How do we do this? And, and so it's it's an interesting moment we are speaking of at this time where there, there's something, something moving. I'm also wondering if right now we might look and see if there's something moving among uh, the people who are here with us. And if uh, I'm not seeing in the chat, if 
as we keep talking, if we would love to have some questions or comments from you in the chat. Uh, we're going to try to do things in uh, Spanish, Italian, French, English. So what's your thought? What's your sense of our call? You can either write your points in there or you're welcome to bring your questions um, and your wisdom because this is this moment where we can only do this together. So let's see what shows while up. People, while people are thinking. Yes. But I'll say I, I'm delighted you, you mentioned uh, this morning's reading because Philip, whose name means horse lover, uh, is the patron saint of hitchhikers, yeah. of course. Uh, and I used to do a lot of hitchhiking in my youth. And it hadn't occurred to me that maybe he's a good model for the theologian. Hmm. He, he goes where they go. Of course, the story mirrors the Emmaus story. Uh, he doesn't say to, to uh, the eunuch, this is where you must go. He says, oh, Yorga, I'll go with you. And and it's the eunuch who says, I don't understand. He's at the service of the conversation of, of the eunuch with the Bible. And I think theology at its best is always at the service of conversation. Um, and so in that way, I imagine the, the theologian, you know, like when two heads of state meet and you have the interpreters in the middle helping them to talk. So uh, the role of the theologian isn't to drown out everybody else and say, shut up, I'm talking. It's to be the mediator, the one who opens up the conversation, who's the servant, servant of friendship, servant of conversation. It's a great image. I did not know that about Philip. Uh, and, and it is true. It's all of this is to be at the service. I think that's even a, a real moment uh, of Pope Francis's effort to all of us that whatever um, our ministry is, uh, whether our state of life, it is to love and serve. Um, from wherever we're coming and and that that shifts how we even look at who's around the table, who's welcome, uh, but also the calls. Um, I, I think of right now, as we look at the needs in the world and in the church, there's no limit. There's no limit to the to the calls. And this moment in the church is actually, an effort to widen, uh, you know, and I, I would love to just ask people, please, um, if you could during this Easter season, make a commitment to reading the Synod Synthesis document. It's actually quite short. It's, it, it's chapters are two, two and a half pages long each. And there's some incredible gems in there, including on uh, religious life. Uh, so for as small of a group as we are in religious life compared to everybody, uh, we're, we're very much being asked to, to offer that, that lens of the spirit and our charisms forth. But the document you know, it invites opportunities such as, are there, are there times where others can preach? who have the gift of preaching, uh, who has the gift of healing, who has the gift of listening, what are the different gifts? And, and in the document are real questions mm -hmm. of what new ministries are needed. Uh, how do we widen, uh, including the participation of women? It was, it was Cardinal McElroy who just made it very clear uh, by saying it everywhere he was at. He said, the only place where urgency was listed, the urgency was for the participation of women and mm. finding spaces for women to be at the tables of discernment, mm. at the tables of discussion. I, and that's honoring the gifts that God has given. It's not saying women have something more than men. They have equally, equally the gifts. Uh, it was again, Cardinal Hollerick who said, 
I've never heard that the baptism of women is any different than the baptism of men. And so what are the needs and cries in our church and world? And, and how do we bring this forth? Mm -hmm. So um, so I noticed there's one question here. Uh, oops, I may have lost it. Um, and it's about polarization is also in the church. And can our church be synodal if this isn't addressed um, with practices, uh, you know, how might we work this through? What's your thought, Timothy? Well, I want to know what the adventure of another person is. Um, let me give the example. I, I, I'm very lucky to have quite a lot of time meeting young students, university students. And often people say, oh, they're more conservative. They want to go back to the tradition. And that goes against all that my generation sought to do. And I think that that's a totally wrong approach. Because what you have to do is to say they too are on an adventure. It's in a different one, but they too are searching. And have I the courage to open my heart to their search? Um, it may be contrary, but it's not contradictory. Um, and once I do, once I see that they're also on a journey, then I think we can help each other. Then we can understand each other. A lot of it's about imagination. When I listen to people who are different, do I imagine what it is for them to be them? Do I imagine why they come to hold these positions? I, I mentioned, a, I think maybe in the Synod, a big debate we had in the order between people who saw preaching as mainly about dialogue and people who saw preaching as mainly about proclamation of the truth, which we have. And then we realized that most of the former had worked in Asia, a land of dialogue, the whole continent of dialogue. Most of the latter came from the ex-Soviet Union. They had different lives. They had, you had to enter their lives. You had to hear their stories. And then you could begin to be illuminated. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, our friends, uh, I think, uh, could we have, I think there's a question here in, from Nadia. Uh, could you read that? Navoika, I think. What are you seeing unfolding in the in-between synod? And now it's disappeared from the screen. Shall I say something about that? Yeah, there's something here. Sorry, it's it's there are a number of things here. Grazie dell'opportunità di intervenire. It's Italian. Yeah. Uh, okay, I'm going to read it in Italian, in Italiano. Eh, grazie dell'opportunità di intervenire. In questo tempo sto pensando in che, in che modo le religiose e i religiosi del mondo potrebbero far sentire la loro voce per far cessare le guerre. Come dimostrare concretamente che vogliamo la pace ad ogni costo, ma non a parole, ma con dei gesti profetici, profetici e simbolici. Insomma, farci sentire perché siamo davvero una moltitudine. Credo che oggi ci sia bisogno di concretezza. We'll try to imagine what this might mean in the Middle East now. There are all sorts of young people in the Middle East, Israelis and Palestinians, who are at this moment trying to reach out in friendship across the barrier. And I think uh, we religious in these places like Ukraine, like the Middle East, can we have the courage to befriend people whom our society our companions, our families, will see only as enemies. 
we had an Egyptian Jewish Dominican who converted to Catholicism, who founded a place called Nevis Shalom, which was midway between a Jewish kibbutz, a Muslim village, and a Cistercian monastery in Israel, where people met. I actually helped build it when I was a student. I'm uh, not very well, I think, but I built, probably fell down. But the concrete reaching out at risk. Nothing's going to be achieved if we don't take the risk of exposing ourselves to rejection and even to hatred because we talk with those whom others see as the enemy. And I think that's what we have to do in Israel at the moment. We have to... My community lives in just north of the Damascus Gate in Jerusalem. And can we reach out both to Jews and to Palestinians and say, this is your home for both of you? That's powerful. Thank you. Thank you for that. And it, it is certainly something we are continuing to engage. And as Pope Francis said, this war that's happening uh, bit by bit, point by point, and there is this call for, for another way, and, and this is another way. We have two questions in Spanish, so uh, I think, Voika, do you want to read those sure. together? Both of them? Okay. Um, en español, eh, hace 20 años hice en teología un seminario sobre nuevos ministerios. Seguimos preguntándonos hoy. ¿Hay algún avance concreto? Eh, y después, ¿cómo responder a la urgencia pastoral de Eucaristía y absolución cuando faltan tantos sacerdotes? I didn't get the last, the first one. I heard, I didn't hear about the priests. And what, what was that, please? Sorry, what was your question? I didn't hear you, Timothy. Ah, yes. My, my question, I, I, the first half of the question, which I heard, was about concrete advances in ministry. Uh, and I think there are, aren't there, Maria? You're more on the ground than I am in Rome. But there are a lot of discussions about the ministry of the lector. Um, and a lot of people think are exploring the possibility uh, that preaching the gospel at the Eucharist should be open to people who have the who are lectors. Now, uh, and certainly already women are, 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 are able to be um, lectors. And I think that would respond to one little urgency which is that we need the voice of women in the Eucharist. We need the voice of women in church when we gather as an assembly. ¿Cómo responder a la urgencia pastoral de Eucaristía y absolución cuando faltan tantos sacerdotes? Ah, right. Right. Gosh. That's a brilliant question. Maria, I think you might have a very good way into answering it. <laughs> you know, it was really... Um... When we look back at the Synod on the Amazon, um, one of the places that was so difficult was where literally media came in and social media and, and where it really wasn't helpful to allow people to discern and hear. And, and, and you saw all the tensions among the cultures coming forth and, and different groups that felt certain ways. One of the gifts of that Synod was that because it really was about the Amazonia and the people and that same cry that we're hearing from from our 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 friend asking the question and it was a cry that we don't have the ministers we need and and people are hungry 
people are hungry for the word, for Eucharist. And what came from it actually was a new Episcopal conference that is the Amazonia. And interestingly, it's either an archbishop or a cardinal who's the president of it, but the vice presidents are three women. Uh, and at least one of them is a religious sister. And, and one of the things, I, and there was a wonderful interview of, or an article about her uh, in either America or some other, more than one journal probably, but she spoke, had a chance to speak with the Pope too. And she said, we're just doing, uh, it, what we're doing is meeting the needs of the people. And so people were, you know, if there are people at, in the Amazon, we're going in there and we're going to find ways to, to, you know, offer the Eucharist, uh, you know, I mean, not to celebrate the Eucharist. They, she wasn't saying that, but it was just to say people aren't there. And so how do we creatively find our way? And, and the people are hungry. Uh, the other piece is what I found very touching and daunting at the same time was across the listening sessions across the globe, what came in the, before the first synod was the hunger of lay people for mature adult faith formation. They were saying, we have many gifts, but we need opportunities too. And so how do we find ways to open up education but also invite the creativity of the people of God in, in so many places. So I think, you know, we can think about being, I can be in Chicago or here in Rome where you could have a, a Eucharistic liturgy every, every 15 minutes. Um, but then there are other places. And it was actually a priest I met, uh, a French priest uh, a few weeks ago who said, I don't stay here during Holy Week because there are more than enough priests but I go to my home diocese because there aren't enough. And so I think we're really hearing the cries and to say, so what, what is this, an invitation of the spirit? What, what is it being asked of us at this time? Um, you know, uh, people I, have preaching courses, have the gift and the skill of preaching. Pope Francis has spoken about you know, sometimes preaching is, is uh, a penance for the people listening you know, to it. And you know how much effort it really takes. So there are those who have the gift. Some, some, some are not even Dominicans that have the gift of preaching. And, uh, but, but how do we open up the space? Because the, the people are there. And we're really in the synod saying co-responsible discipleship. Uh, and this is something I would also say to us as religious. We have opportunities to be ever more inclusive at, and to even do collaboration in new ways so that it's not just you can work with us, but when we sense there's a, a common charism to together find our way forward and, and work across many ways so, and, and to be in the parishes where we can be a presence um, and not necessarily as the wisdom, but as the one who might listen. As you said, Timothy, you're there listening to the young and encouraging them, I bet, and inviting them to be creative and to, you know, Pope Francis says, ruido, make noise, um, offer something. So how, how might we is really a question. I also saw, and it, then I'm going to let you say your response. There was a question there about what are we sensing in this time in between, in between the synod and, and what's calling? So not just what we're seeing, but what's calling? That was one of the questions. I think we have others, but. Could I just add a little bit on the forgiveness? Please. Uh, when Jesus appears in the locked room, he says to all the disciples, whose sins you forgive, they are forgiven whose sins you retain, they are retained. So the forgiveness of sins is, in a way, the duty of all Christians. It's not just what priests do. And I think you could see this in uh, um, 
in Rwanda after the genocide, the whole church engaged in the process of forgiveness in what was called the very traditional African Rwandan practice of the, I think it was called the guacaca, mm -hmm. which means grass. And so the church organized, even before the government caught on, practices of forgiveness throughout the country. And 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 I so I think as Maria says, we can be inventive. We can find ways in which there are practices of forgiveness. I think also I studied canon law, but I'm afraid for only about 20 minutes. And I'm probably about the most ignorant person of canon law there is. But I think you will find that in situations of urgency, when there's no priest, any baptized Catholic can offer absolution. On a battlefield, if there's no priest around, anybody can offer God's absolution. How are we going to mobilize that possibility which already exists? How are we going to be able to um, make it a part of the life of the whole church? We need to think about. But forgiveness is for all of us. Absolutely. And thank you. Thank you for that. I think it moves us even to the conversations, not only for the Synod participants, but also for all of us here, for all of us. Um, you know, those those are some of the questions that are, are coming forth. Somebody was asking what um, what are what's unfolding in between this and what's happening. So I you know, this was already announced, but there are going to be 10 different topical um, groups. The Synod was realizing they can't cover everything uh, in the net in one month. Uh, and so my sense of it, and this is just my sense of it, is that there's a real effort to say, how do we create a road that's wide enough so that we can have those conversations that and discussions and discernments that need to happen. So not just the discussion, because that was the shift with synodality. Synodality is not just listen, but it's mutually receptive and responsive listening. So to receive it and also to respond, not simply say, well, I heard you. Now let's move on. But it, it's a new moment in there. And that's, there's a series, and I don't know where those committees are, but there are also five working groups, literally, and you can find that on the document from March 14th, that, that look at what does it mean to be a synodal church at the local level? What are the relationships? And it includes questions of how do we create accountability, transparency? Um, where do we include, like, the lay people, the people, and decision making, decision taking, how do we widen that? What's new? The, there are questions in there. And there are working groups, but it doesn't mean that if you're not on a working group, that's not your question. These are the questions that I think the census fide, the people I, are invited to engage. So I, I definitely want to call forth all of us here to, to look at those five areas Take just one or two and have a conversation this season. Timothy, what's, I, what do you think? I think there's a connection between the question about how we live this period with the challenge you mentioned earlier, Maria, about the loss of confidence in democracy. Because uh, many people around the world are finding that governments are not actually solving problems. There's a loss of confidence that uh, democratic government works. Uh, as they say it so often, the, na the, the nation state is too big for the small problems and too small for the big problems. And so people aren't, don't have confidence that actually things can be changed. And I think that's the question in the church too. 
do we believe that anything can change? I remember that uh, when Yves Congar, my brother, French Dominican, I was his assistant for a year, very simple, you know, making coffee, nothing grand. And when he went to the council, he couldn't believe that they would really take seriously his hopes, his fears, his writing. He was highly skeptical that anything would happen. And his slow conversion was when he found that actually, yes, something was happening. He did matter. He had a voice. And I think every one of us has the responsibility to believe that the church can change. Another French Dominican who is master of the order called Vincent de Canonge, he used to say cowardice and courage are both contagious. Which will you mediate? And I think every one of us is responsible about whether we basically communicate courage or, or despair. Uh, that is, that's our particular individual personal responsibility of every one of us in the community. It's, thank you for that. Thank you for that invitation. And I will say as a woman at the Synod, I did find uh, our brothers, uh, at all manner of brothers, eager to listen. Um, open to listen. I was in mostly English speaking tables, but in other places during breaks, I, I found the Spanish speaking people. And I, I did find that there was a real, uh, it, there was that invitation that came and it came from our retreat. Will you, could you be open to other voices? And, and Pope Francis was really intentional about bringing diverse voices in. So, and, and voices that we wouldn't hear from always. And so somebody from, you know, the, the people who um, work with the migrants, uh, the, the refugees uh, on boats, somebody who, who works on the boat that pulls people out of the water. Um, someone- Luca. Ah, thank you, thank you for his name. You know, and then I, uh, another of of our brothers that was there, who you know is differently abled, and said, I, "I'm here to remind you, uh, being in a wheelchair, I have as much to offer as those of you walking on two feet." And so it was that real effort, and also people who came thinking from different lenses and and what they where they go with this. What would you ask of the people here and who will watch this recording in these next few months? What would you, what, what do you sense? What would you invite us to? I, I would just say, share hope. Don't share despair. But I keep seeing little questions, Maria, popping up here. Please. I only see the first couple of lines. I was wondering... Well, there might not be another question or two there. Ah, if you're willing, this is wonderful. Uh, let me read a few, a few, and then you can answer them in a large. And we can, yeah. Bulk. Yes, we can. Uh, do you see liberation theology undergirding synodality? Um, do you, uh, sorry, these are going faster than I am seeing. Um how do we see this kind of synodality in our Eucharistic liturgies? How do we in religious life uh, think about things? And not only uh, there's, there's depending on what part of the world you're in, there's fewer, there's less, but how do we see this moment as a graced moment? Uh, and, and what would that mean? Um, so how do we listen to one another? Uh, in in a moment where people sometimes feel like they are a lone voice. And then I'm going to ask uh, Navoika, or if we have any, we ha I don't think we have any French questions, questions in French. If Please, to our sisters and brothers who speak French, if there's a question, we want to try to get something from you as well. But you could start with answering all of those questions. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Thank you. I'll just say a little bit on liberation. Uh, I think what changes us, what uh, makes us feel powerless is fear. Uh, it said in the in the when Jesus appeared to the disciples in John's Gospel in the locked room, they were locked because of fear of the Jews. So it's good to ask what you're what are you afraid of? Are you afraid of getting hurt? What locks the door? Um, and I think. The, the angels appear to the women at the tomb and they say, do not be afraid. It's the normal opening conversation gamble with angels. If you meet an angel, that's the, usually the first thing they say. Don't be afraid. So I think it's a very good thing. If we want to be free, let's be free of our fears. I think also, of course, liberation theology gives priority to the voice of the poor. And that is one of the study groups which has been set up by the Pope to uh, answer to the next synod, the voice of the poor. Can we hear it? Do I hear the voice of the poor outside the door at Blackfriars in Oxford, where I live? Every time I go outside that door, there are people sitting on the pavement. Do I hear them? Do I see them? That's a question for me too. Thank you for that. And, you know, and it's, there's the follow-up with it. Um, you know, do I hear the people made poor by so many, so many circumstances? Um, how will anyone, how would they know? How would they know? How would anyone know? that this is our preferential option uh, for the poor and vulnerable. What, what does that look like in our congregations and in our lives? It's a, it's a powerful, powerful question. Uh, do, do we have any more in Spanish? Or do we want to, are we maybe just aware of trying to get all the different voices? No? so much so much in there i think if we Thank ask you. what's a, a great is this a graced moment I, I think it's a moment many of us have been waiting for ever since the the second vatican council and it's interesting it's a grace moment because of the media 20 years ago 10 years ago we couldn't be having this zoomed conversation uh we'd all have to travel across the planet and add to the pollution and be too exhausted to talk to each other. Now we are talking. This is a graced moment. Every time, every morning we have mass here at Blackfriars, you're all welcome. Two or 300 people come from, listen in, watch from Vietnam. So it is a graced moment. There are new forms of being in contact, of making friendships, which have never ever been possible before so this is truly a moment of grace and i think it goes back to your point about uh, this is this time is an invitation to risk hope mm -hmm. to risk it uh and it's not confidence uh it's not optimism it's such a deeper peace and and it is that that grace we're being invited to is you know, it's it's my peace. It's not what you envision as your peace, Maria, but but it's far more than you can imagine. And it is this moment of, you know, when when we see so much going on to say, are you willing to give your part to this? Because if you can, we always are given choice, right? We always have that the inner freedom, interior freedom. Uh, and it's it's the invitation of can you can you risk it? Because what is the other option? And I think people at the Senate, this was an experience was it was in their third round. And, and one of the things I would like to just invite everyone to really uh, beg of you and we're going to have learning session. We're going to have sessions in the different languages. 
or how to do conversation in the spirit if that isn't something you have a lot of experience with because there's there's a way to learn it um, and, and to use it. Um, I have been finding across continents when communities have been using this, it's changing something. Even once a month, that even if it's sharing the scripture or your own journeys, something is moving in this. And, and it's, uh, it's really a, a tender model. Um, somebody who's saying, what are you hearing across the globe? Has been a sense that when that's used, people literally feel heard. You listen to me. And that happened at the Synod. So you have three, four minutes to speak. People really listen. They were leaning in. They, they were pondering. I've never been so tired at night. And I realized because I was listening so hard. And, and it's that invitation to, to do that, to, to offer it, to be with people who, who think differently, um, but also to just as a community take the space and, and time for this. And, and who else might you invite to your circle? Um, is it, you know, it's expanding the tent uh, also means uh, who else might we invite to this conversation? And, and the wounds are both within religious life, within the church, within the world, within ourselves, but the healing is present and, and being invited in all those areas as well. So I do invite you, um, find some way in the local to engage. Um, and sometimes we think the Vatican takes a very long time to move things. But I just offer you one, one movement that truly has been stunning in its speed. All over, people have been saying, we want to find more ways to have our parish priests engaged in the Synod. Uh, we're not finding them involved in some of our places. And how can we do this? Literally, the Vatican and the Pope heard, listened, and heard this from all over. And at the end of this month, uh, for five days, there's a gathering called Parish Priests for the Synod. And there are representatives from all over the globe that are coming together in Sacrifano, where we had our retreat. And are having experiences, will have experiences of, you know, some best practices, learning about the synod, experiencing conversation in the spirit. I So invitations, they'll have a conversation with Pope Francis as well. That got organized in a very few months. And to me, that's really stunning. And, and I do ask everyone, pray. Pray, pray for this. Uh, we're all in need of conversion. Um, so we pray together for openness. Timothy. I'd just say, I mean, I think we're getting towards the end of our time, really, aren't we? Uh, when you listen, don't listen with your eyes shut. Uh, if you see people's faces, uh, then you often hear better. Look at the see their face and see it as the, a human face. See it as a face that is their joy and, and suffering. Let, see their eyes. Once you look really into the eyes of anybody, I think you cannot hate them, you cannot despise them, but you have to see. That was the song of Israel. Let your face shine on us and we shall be saved. We have to be that face. We have to see that face. Thank you. And that is a powerful place to stop. And we end as we began with the Emmaus story. Um, he helped the risen Christ, help them see, help them hear, help them remember, and help them go back and go forward. Uh, and proclaim the good news. So I thank you so much, uh, our brother Timothy, for your time, for your uh, commitment, for your accompaniment, and uh, for being a brother among us all. So we pray for you, and uh, we will all pray for one another. And do pray 
uh, that the spirit that we may be open, all of us, to what the spirit is inviting in these months in between the two synods, but already in our local areas to add experimentum as religious life knows so well, to try, to try something new um, because that's, that's the invitation. So thank you, Timothy. Thank you, Maria. God bless. Bye to everybody.